Welcome. Today we're going to be taking a look at inheritance using R as our framework so we can look at the concepts that go along with that in computer science. Um, so I want to give a little bit of background before we get started with this. So I want to explore the concept of computer science inheritance in Java, you, uh, the language specifically, using R as our framework so we can do that. And object-oriented programming, we use inheritance so we can make it so we can model real-world objects a lot easier. It also allows us to cut down the amount of code and logic we use so we can do some cool stuff with that. I picked art specifically because it allows us to add a much more diverse culture incorporated into our project we're working with, and we'll see this in the actual code as we go through this in the other video. But we can do some cool stuff with it and also have a diversity that we don't normally simply just see when we're talking about some of the ideas of computer science. It also demonstrates how we can use our outside interests and things that we like and want to enjoy, and how we can share that in our computer science environment. So that's one of the reasons why we have that going for on this. So here we can see a quick uh, class diagram to show about the relationship we're working with so we can see how inheritance is designed on this. And so we have an abstract class art that has subclasses of story, performance, picture, and sculpture. And then again, further subclasses of performance with music and of sculpture with physical sculpture and digital sculpture. And then we have an interface called interactable. And we'll take a look to see how all that works as we go through the project and see what's going on inside that. And we'll take a look at also in our code video to go more detail on that as well. So we take a little base class right here. We're using an abstract base class as our foundation for this because that way we can have a framework for all this we can instantiate, but all the pieces show up as the relationships. We can have some pre-implemented methods we can use and work with and then take that and do cool stuff from there. Because it's abstract, of course, we can instantiate it on our own, but the constructor of our subclasses will all call that using super inside that. This also allows us to have polymorphic storage in our array list and arrays inside our project. So I can have an array list or an array of different data types using the abstract um, art class and store all the things inside that and do some cool stuff with it. Um, by having an abstract base class as well, also allows us so we can have code to be implemented directly at that base class level. So all of our getters and setters for our base class are available and can be used directly by our subclasses without having to rewrite all that code. So it's a great way to get access to that. So here we can see the quick structure of the art class itself. I've collapsed down all the methods. You can see just what's inside that. So we have a data member called creators and a, a data member called title. Those are the array list of string and a, a string itself. Then we have two constructors and some methods that go along with that. And we can see we have getters and setters with that. We have our constructor we go over specifically right here. And again, remember, because these constructors are for an abstract class, I can't instantiate them directly, but I can reference them using the super. And so I have a no parameter constructor and a two parameter string constructor that I can use to initialize those. And as you can see, I initialize my data members with that and have it so I can go through it and work with them inside that structure. Now our subclasses are the subclasses that we're going to do and actually work with inside that. And so just a quick reminder again, a subclass has access to all the public and protected information in the parent class. Subclasses must call the parent class constructor if a zero parameter constructor is not present. We do have a zero uh, parameter constructor, so I can skip that. But I always, like I said earlier, I always like to call the parent class super constructor by default because it goes for good design and make sure I always recognize that I'm calling the parent class constructor to initialize my default variables before I come down and actually work with the ones I'm working with in the subclass. Ordered methods in a subclasses again operate using the subclasses information even if the instance is stored in a parent class's variable. So even if I have this stored as an art variable or some other parent class variable, my subclass will still run the subclass version because it happens at runtime based on the type of object it's working with. And again, the relationship we're talking about, subclasses have an is a relationship with the parent class. So a piece of music is a art because music inherits from our indirectly. So we have that information of an is a relationship we have inside that. And again, we'll take a look at that subclass relationship in a little bit more detail here in a second. Here's that subclass relationship in a bit more detail for that UML. So we can see right here on the bottom of our tree, we have music is a subclass of performance. Performance is a subclass of art. Story is a subclass of art. Picture is a subclass of art, so picture is a art. Physical sculpture is a sculpture is a art. Digital sculpture is a sculpture is a art. And so sculpture is another abstract class that we can have inside that, and it has two subclasses from there. Um, music inherits from performance, so music is a performance, and performance is an art, so music is an art as well. And so that's the idea that we have for that relationship, so we can see what's going on inside that. And we'll talk about how that works in more detail as we actually look through the code. So the first thing I'm going to talk about, though, again, is the idea of the use of the super parents. That's the constructor call we do to access our parent class constructor because we do not actually, <clears throat> because we don't actually inherit the constructor. We use super parents to reference that. And a call to super, again, must be the first line of code of the constructor. It can't be after any other lines of code. I mean, blank lines, yes, but actual code, no. And so you can only access one level of the parent class. You can't go from music all the way directly to art. You can only go from music to performance. That's the only way you can have that. You can skip it, but you shouldn't do it. And remember, you always want to initialize all the subclass data members after that super call because if the subclass data member is not initialized, there's no initialization of them because the uh, super call doesn't have any reference to subclass of information. 
So here I have some examples of the super parens call. And so again, we have our art constructor over here on the top left. We have our ab abstract class sculpture that extends art, and it has two constructors as well. It has a three parameter constructor and a two parameter constructor. And I have my public class digital sculpture that extends sculpture. And so I have my public digital sculpture constructor takes a string title, a string artist, and a string software titles. And its first line of that constructor is a call to super, passing a title, and then artist, and then digital, which goes up then to the three parameter constructor up here at the top right there. So I have a public sculpture passing a title, artist, and a media type, which sends the title and artist to the super constructor, which goes to the arts two parameter constructor, and then initializes the media type of the sculpture data member with that media type parameter that is sent inside that sculpture. And so that's how we can make that so we can have that information go from the uh, subclass to the parent class to the abstract base class and load that information through all the data members directly. Another example of that right here is we have an art on the top left again, then we have a performance subclass, which has a super call to the, um, just the empty parens on that. And then we have a performance with two parameters, with two parameters on there going title and main, which obviously goes to the two parameter art constructor. And we have our music constructor, and so we have a music with two parameter constructor with a title and a performer, and then music uh, constructor with a title, performer, and a type, which again, the title and performer go to call the super call, and then initializes the type as unknown. Or the three parameter constructor takes those two um, first parameters and sends them to the super call. And the third parameter gets assigned to the subclass data member type, which has no reference to performance or art above that. And that's why we have to initialize that below the call to super inside there. We have super dot as well. And again, super dot is how I can access parent class implementation of any method by calling super dot method name. And unlike the super call, this can be placed anywhere inside any subclass in a method itself. So we can even be inside a subclass method of a different name. It can always access that information. So we can use that in non-overridden methods as well. So that's what we have with that. And so we'll take a quick example of that over here. In our art classes to string, it's an overed method because it's overriding from the object class because it's an indirectly inheriting from that. And so we have our string description, this art piece is title plus title and backslash n. And description's added the creator size, the creator specifically, and it goes through each name inside creators and adds each of those names to that and returns that string. The music classes to string method is again, it's an override method on that. And so we call the parent class of music, which is the performance. We call that uh, performances to string, assign that to the description. And then we assign from that, we add it to a musical performance type, and then we add a tab, and then what type of musical performance it is. It goes up to the parent classes to string method, which would then go to and grab that information, which returns that, and then comes back down to the subclass in this case, and then adds the musical performance type information and appends that to that value. And so we can use the idea of super dot to access that, especially inside our to string method. Another example of super dot, we can see with our reference over here, we have our art class, which is a subclass of sculpture and a subclass of physical sculpture and digital sculpture. And so as you can see in art, I have a get explanation method up here in the diagram. And so I have my public string get explanation and it returns an empty string. Oh, amazing, wonderful method. And then I have in my sculpture um, overridden method, I have a public string get, um, get explanation, returns an abstract class implemented method because it is an abstract class, but it's, hey, I'm explaining what it is. And then I have my subclass of this get explanation, where I say combined, I say my string parent is equal to super dot get explanation, it calls the parent classes version, and then combined is equal to parent plus backslash n, and you should ask this dot creators dot two string about the arrays dot two string software use. This is the digital sculpture is used for that because we have that software use variable that we're using to actually grab that information from that digital sculpture and creating that information, sending it back out to the user using super dot to get information from the parent class and send it back down to the subclass and send it down to the subclass again from there. So we have that information, we can go from working with that and do some cool stuff. Interfaces are another cool thing inside Java. So an interface is the Java type that is a promised implement specific behaviors, aka methods inside there. And so if a class implements interface, its subclasses also automatically implement that interface and allows for storage of otherwise dissimilar types via polymorphism. It's a really great way to group non-similar things in a structure like an array or an array list. And it's a great moth, um, tool we can use for that. And so we have that example inside this um, project right here. So we have our interface interactable, which has a single method interact, which takes an int level as a void method. And interactable is um, um, implemented by the performance type and by the digital sculpture type. And so as you can see right here in performance, we have in the UML diagram, we have an interact method that has a void method. Music does not have its own specific implementation of that interact method. However, because it inherits from performance, it accesses that parent method directly because it's a public method, because uh, interface methods must automatically be public. And digital sculpture also has an interact method on that. So we can see that we have the structure with that as a part of our design right here inside this. And so we have that information right here with the dash lines indicating that it's an implemented method from that um, abstract interface right up above on the top. And because music inherits from performance, it doesn't have to implement directly, it implements the uh, method indirectly because it has access to it. 
And so in my public interface interactable, as you can see, it's just the method header itself. So public void interact, the parameters it needs, and then a semicolon at the end. And so we have in my performance class, I have the interactable implements at the top right there. And the interact method in this case, int level is equal to nine, level minus equals demo, the parameter, level is equal to level plus three, great use of stuff. And sculpture dope equals a new digital sculpture, three sets of quotes, then a semicolon, and dope.update media quotes. And then because that is a local variable, it gets thrown away, and that's great. That's a wonderful use of a fantastic method right there. However, in our digital sculpture method, we have extend sculpture and once interactable, and its interact method has a system.println on it. So you've interacted at level and then it prints out that level. So you can have completely different um, implementations of that. We have a throwaway method over here inside a performance subclass. And then in, um, in our implementation on digital sculpture, we print out information about that. They're both equally valid. In fact, we can have an empty method right there and be totally fine as well. As long as you actually have a, a full implementation of that, you're good to go. And so that's just a quick review of some of the um, ideas that we'll have inside the art project. Take a look in the next video where we can see actual code itself and how that interacts and runs through that, giving some demonstrations of how these methods actually work with a project. I hope this is helpful. Cheers, we'll see you next time, and have a good day. Bye-bye.